Chapter thirty eight of the Apostle of Alaska The Story of William Duncan of Metlakatla by John W. Arctander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. Some Metlakatla History One of the first public buildings erected in Metlakatla, Alaska was the village store. It is operated by Mr. Duncan and carries a stock of general merchandise of the average value of about twenty thousand dollars the goods are sold to the natives at a small advance over the cost price not far away from the store is mr duncan's private dwelling and office in the front part of this building is his office on one side of this office is his bedroom and on the other a storeroom for his account books and papers in the rear is a dining room high ceiled as his office and both heated only with fireplaces adjoining the dining room are three bedrooms and the kitchen in this lowly dwelling mr duncan has always insisted on remaining though far better quarters have for years been near at hand but remain unoccupied except for occasional visitors during the first two years in metlakatla alaska there was no regular house of worship the temporary schoolroom was too small so at first the services were held on the beach and the rocks and later on in a shed built for industrial purposes but on the twenty ninth day of april eighteen eighty nine a queer-looking building with twelve gables intended originally for the public school was finished and here divine services were held until the large fine church was completed of late this building which is heated with hot water and lighted by large oil lamps had been denominated the town hall the natives have their feasts or tea parties here on festive occasions and here all concerts and public entertainments take place in march eighteen ninety the boys home a building in the shape of st peter's cross was ready for occupancy but could not be taken in use till the next year when a new teacher arrived the boys home because of want of proper teachers did not prove a success its name was changed to the educational building and the public school for children of both sexes was there housed in it now are also located the young men's evening schoolroom the sunday school teachers classroom the place for the midweek prayer meeting and the public reading room the same fall the mission building or the industrial training school for girls with rooms on one side for the teacher's family and on the other for the doctors as well as for the pharmacy of the village which is well stocked with all necessary medicines and preparations was ready from the builder's hand upstairs are dormitories for twenty-four girls and below in the centre of the house the dining room and in front a large school hall which now for several years has been used as the council room where the village council holds its meetings both this hall and the large school room in the educational building are heated by open fireplaces in the center of the room a large hood of sheet iron comes down above the fireplace and not only carries away the smoke but acts as a splendid ventilator in the spring of eighteen ninety a cannery building was erected and that summer a beginning was made of the salmon canning industry four hundred and seventy cases of four dozen cans each were canned but as mr duncan's funds were not sufficient to carry on this business on the scale which was necessary if it should prove profitable he finally was induced to ask some friends of his for assistance in the following way a corporation the metlakatla industrial company was formed with twenty five thousand dollars capital stock of this stock mr duncan and a few of the natives took about half the other half was donated by friends of the mission with the understanding that if the enterprise came through all right they should be paid back the money advanced if not they would lose it and he would be under no obligation to repay them on the first of january eighteen ninety five mr duncan formally turned over to this corporation all the industries of the colony the store and the sawmill as well as the cannery this business was managed so prudently that in nineteen o five the corporation could be dissolved as having served its purpose the native stockholders were paid back their money with fifteen per cent interest per annum for the time they had had their money invested this interest had been paid to them annually the other stockholders received their money back with seven and a half per cent interest 
and mr duncan now personally took over all the business and the property including the two steamers in the meantime acquired boats barges nets and the entire stock of lumber merchandise and canned salmon on hand since that time all of the business has been carried on by him personally with the aid of trusted native employees in the different departments in the month of june eighteen ninety the village had the honor of receiving the first official visit of the governor of alaska the hon lyman e knapp the governor arrived on a united states revenue cutter on sunday but so strict was the sabbath observance rule at metlakatla that even the governor of the territory could not be officially received until the following day when a platform was erected near the beach and a reception held for him speeches were delivered by leading natives and by the governor who promised to do all in his power to secure them an established and definite right to the island and what they always have so much desired citizenship the first of these rights was accorded to them by congress the next year but the boon of citizenship is still being withheld from them though president roosevelt in his admirable message to congress in nineteen o five strongly urged upon that body to grant this privilege to the metlakatla indians whom he did not hesitate in his interesting state paper to characterize as highly intelligent and civilized and fully entitled to all the rights and privileges of citizenship congress however failed to act up to his suggestion in this matter as in so many others subsequent events have shown that the temper of congress with reference to granting citizenship or the right to acquire citizenship to any other than caucasians and negroes was such that there was no hope of passing an act allowing these highly civilized indians the right to become naturalized a right which is freely granted every day in the year to other much less intelligent and patriotic aliens senator newt nelson of minnesota who has taken a great interest in the welfare of metlakatla therefore on february fourth nineteen o seven introduced a bill to grant them the right to obtain licenses as pilots captains and engineers and to run and operate their own motor boats with the same force and effect as if they were citizens of the united states this bill by kindly aid of president roosevelt then as always the determined friend of the matlakatlans who instructed the department of commerce and labor to take all proper steps to secure its prompt passage became a law in the very short time remaining of that session of congress and on the fourth day of march a d nineteen o seven received the signature of the president it is to be hoped that in the near future congress will see that it cannot any longer afford to refuse to these civilized and intelligent men the right of citizenship which was explicitly promised them as they thought with the full approval of the national government by the governor of alaska when they first came to this country in the summer of eighteen ninety one things had progressed so far at metlakatla that six thousand cans of salmon were canned and over ten thousand dollars paid to the natives in wages from this branch of the industries alone that winter saw ninety-five new permanent dwellings erected since then their number has been added to so that there now are one hundred and thirty private dwellings all told in the village on november fifth eighteen ninety two the second steam sawmill erected by mr duncan in the village was destroyed by fire at the net loss of nearly nine thousand dollars this second fire which was due to the carelessness of one of the native operators determined mr duncan to make use of the splendid water power obtained from the lake in the clouds filling an old crater about eight hundred feet above sea level in the mountain valley of purple mountain located on the other side of the bay and the overflow of which tumbles down the mountain side at the expense of nine thousand dollars he now built a dam at the mouth of this lake and a pipeline down the mountain side and around the bay and thereby not only provided water power for the new sawmill which now was being run by a pelton water wheel but also furnished all necessary water for the cannery and in addition a splendid water supply for the use of the whole village the business affairs of the colony were now in such shape that this new work was done the mill rebuilt and the new machinery purchased without mr duncan having to call on his friends outside for any help whatsoever 
the twelfth day of february eighteen ninety three was a sad day in the history of metlakahtla for several weeks a north wind had been blowing the north winds in that part of alaska always bring fine weather there had been no rain at all for a long time and everything in the village was as dry as tinder a veritable gale from the northeast was blowing when near noon the fire bell clanged people looked at each other with fear and trembling an awful day for a fire where was it fortunately it had started in the western portion of the village in an hour or two all of that part of the village except two houses which miraculously escaped unscathed though located directly in the path of the flames some twenty dwellings in all with the contents of most of them were wiped out of existence by the fierce fire fiend the best fire department in the world could have done nothing under the circumstances the flames simply kept on licking all with voracious tongues till no more food for them could be found here was a beautiful opportunity for the metlakahtla people to show what christianity had done for them and they did not fail not only did neighbors make room for those who had no home but in less than two days sixteen hundred dollars to be distributed among the fire sufferers was raised right in the little village and about a thousand dollars of the amount came from the poor natives themselves though they were at this very time struggling hard to recover from the losses entailed upon them when they had to give up all that was theirs for the sake of their faith as soon as news of the misfortune reached the outside god touched many hearts and in a very short time nearly three thousand dollars in money and contributions in natura came for the benefit of the sufferers one thousand dollars of this amount from a gentleman in london england henry s welcome esq who on this occasion and not for the first time showed his great interest in mr duncan and the metlakahtla indians this fire stirred the village council up to procure at once four hand pumps with hose for fire protection two fire bells were also bought to be placed in different parts of the town a bucket and ladder company was organized cisterns were located near the houses in short many measures for better protection against fire were now taken within a year the burned district was rebuilt thanks especially to the timely aid granted in eighteen ninety three ground had been broken for the magnificent church to be erected in the village the building of which had been delayed so long only because it was mr duncan's aim to build a church that would in every way be an honor to the place in april eighteen ninety four the raising of the heavy framework was commenced in earnest and on christmas day eighteen ninety six could be dedicated and used for the first time what many people are pleased to call mr duncan's westminster abbey even unto this day the largest church in alaska and most certainly a magnificent temple of worship it is one hundred feet long has a seventy foot span is forty three feet to the ceiling and the tops of the spires on the towers are eighty feet above the ground the cost of this edifice where everything except the fine pipe organ and the gas fixtures is the work of the natives was a little over ten thousand dollars of this amount the natives themselves had contributed twenty five hundred dollars about three thousand dollars had been taken from the benevolent fund one half from the amount already mentioned as having been contributed by friends in england and the united states at an earlier period and the other half from later contributions for the express purpose of helping mr duncan to build this beautiful temple to god but by far the greater amount about forty five hundred dollars was donated by mr duncan himself from his own private funds the church is heated by a hot water plant and is lighted by acetylene gas the cost of maintaining it by way of repairs and painting needed therein included in the cost of the lighting plant from january eighteen ninety seven to july first nineteen o eight was the sum of two thousand seven hundred fifty one dollars thirty cents this does not include pastors organists janitors or any other salaries all these services are at metlakahtla given gratuitously of this amount the natives have by their thanksgiving and new year's offerings since eighteen ninety six raised the sum of two thousand one hundred forty four dollars ninety cents there are no collections taken at the regular services 
from offerings by the tourists of the different excursions visiting metlakahtla during the last twelve years the total sum of one thousand five dollars ninety nine cents has been received so there was on the first day of july nineteen o eight on hand in the church fund a balance of four hundred dollars for a long time after the removal travel about the streets of metlakahtla was after heavy rains and heavy rains are of rather frequent occurrence in the country where the annual rainfall is usually about one hundred twenty inches a decidedly unpleasant undertaking but in the nineties it was concluded to obtain on credit from mr duncan planks to the amount of two thousand dollars and to apply the village tax which in eighteen eighty nine had been fixed at three dollars per annum for each adult to work on the streets in this as in almost all alaska towns the streets consist of plank walks from eighteen ninety five to nineteen hundred considerable work was done and in the latter year the planking of the village streets had been completed during these five years from six hundred dollars to one thousand dollars was every year expended in cash and labor in and about planking the streets in nineteen o three the total expenditure on village improvements was thirteen hundred dollars and in nineteen o six when the whole of the front street was replanked for a distance of about one mile the public work expenditure exceeded fifteen hundred dollars in eighteen ninety seven mr duncan finished the guest house another strange octagonal shaped building which is completely furnished including seven bedrooms upstairs drawing-room library dining-room and a very elaborate kitchen downstairs mr duncan says he has built it for his successor perhaps that is the reason he declines positively to move into it himself for it is in every way more convenient and suitable than the little house containing his den his private library is however installed in this building mr duncan's reasons for the many gables and sides of his building are first that he thinks it gives greater strength to resist the winds which in the winter season can be very violent at metlakahtla and the next because he expects thereby to secure better ventilation as he in the town hall has provided a ventilator in the top portion of every one of the twelve gables in nineteen o five the last public building to be erected at metlakahtla a combination of jail engine house and public library building was completed it is painted in all the national colors the first story is red as befits an engine house if not a jail the library story is painted in white and the cupola in blue the jail portion is a perfectly perfunctory institution the only occupant i have ever known it to have is now and then a small boy whose mother cannot manage him and gets mr duncan to help her by placing him under restraint for a few hours in the summer of nineteen o eight an incorrigible girl had a taste of jail life for a day the public library housed in the second story was installed in the winter of nineteen o five and nineteen o six it is the largest public library in alaska and contains two thousand seventy seven volumes viz three hundred fifty three volumes of religious books three hundred twenty nine of history geography travels and biography thirty eight of politics government and political economy eight hundred forty five of fiction two hundred sixty five of miscellaneous books seventy of music and two hundred sixty five of reference books the latter cannot be removed from the library and must be used there the library is kept open for a couple of hours every saturday night the books in the library most prized by the natives are two volumes of presidential addresses and state papers presented to the library by president roosevelt and bearing upon the fly-leaf of the first volume in the president's own handwriting the inscription with good wishes for the metlakahtla indians from theodore roosevelt october eighth nineteen o five among other books contained in the library is a full set of president roosevelt's works in beautiful morocco binding a deluxe edition of the universal anthology thirty-two volumes a full set of the united states digest of the american digest and of the united states compiled statutes a deluxe edition of talmage's sermons twenty-one volumes an old edition of plutarch's lives six volumes 
printed in london in seventeen fifty eight complete sets of all the works of dickens thackeray marriott scott wilkie collins hall Caine, fenimore j cooper ralph connor george eliot mary a fleming ryder haggard hawthorne mary holland anthony hope bulwer lytton henty carleton emma southworth and mark twain several modern encyclopedias dictionaries and bible dictionaries are also found on the shelves the library was called from the private libraries of prominent citizens of minneapolis minnesota and several publishing houses such as the fleming h revel company funk and wagnalls company s s grant and company the hope publishing company and the west publishing company also made valuable contributions from their publications the northern pacific railway company and the alaska steamship company carried the library books free of expense to their destination and mr duncan kindly housed and shelved them a catalogue of the books in the library has been printed and can be obtained from the librarian for fifty cents as the proceeds from the sale are devoted to meeting the expenses of the library any one who desires to contribute for that purpose can do so by forwarding fifty cents in postage stamps to the librarian of the public library at metlakahtla for a copy of the catalogue it will prove interesting as a memento of the great work done there the natives who obtain books without any fee or charge whatsoever have taken out about one hundred library cards and the library is fairly well patronized on october second nineteen o seven the fiftieth anniversary of mr duncan's arrival at fort simpson was celebrated at metlakahtla it at first was intended to have a central general celebration of the day either at port simpson or old metlakahtla and an invitation was extended to mr duncan to come over there but he absolutely declined to go where old wounds could not help being reopened so the natives of metlakahtla resolved to celebrate the anniversary at their own home they all gathered early in the town hall which was decorated with evergreens festoons and flags four of the elders made impressive and touching addresses interspersed with prayer and four beautiful anthems were sung by the church choir the room was then transformed into a banquet hall where at three p m three hundred people were seated and the good women of metlakahtla served a most excellent dinner while the metlakahtla brass band furnished choice music a fine leather-covered chair was presented to mr duncan by his people john tait and sidney campbell who both were present when he landed at fort simpson fifty years ago addressed him at length in words of appreciation of his life and labor among them and pledged themselves and the people to love him better than ever in the future mr duncan on being led to the chair spoke at length in tsimshian rehearsing like a moses or joshua of old all that god had wrought for them those many years the rev j e chapman a methodist preacher of ketchikan some seventeen miles distant then spoke the crowning event of the day however was the rendering by a choir of forty native voices in most excellent manner of handel's renowned oratorio messiah under the leadership of edward marsden with benjamin a haldane at the organ the thirteenth of june nineteen o eight was the fiftieth anniversary of the preaching by mr duncan of his first sermon in tsimshian the day was remembered in prayer in every house at metlakahtla but no public celebration occurred mr duncan does not care much for anniversaries and the celebration on october second nineteen o seven would probably never have taken place had it depended on him the fact remains however that the wonderful work which has been done and the remarkable results which we find in the beautiful village of metlakahtla are practically under god the sole work of this one man and others undoubtedly feel that the memory of this fact should be kept green however much he personally by reason of his innate modesty may deprecate it we have seen that with the exception of five years when he had the benefit of the invaluable services of mr tomlinson and dr bluett duncan he while at old metlakahtla had practically no help in his work except that of the native teachers which he himself had educated most of the time he has labored in alaska he has been in the same position 
and when this has been so it is not because he was not willing to secure the aid of competent and able assistance time after time they have come to him and gone again after a short stay it is not given to every one to endure the isolation and solitude of the position as he has been able to do it is not as easy a matter as one might imagine the climate is trying the difficulties of the work are manifold the life becomes almost that of a hermit it may be that mr duncan has so long been accustomed to being monarch of all he surveys that assistance chafe under the form of government which he has unwittingly established at metlakahtla i think it may safely be characterized as an absolute monarchy although the monarch is both kind pleasant and lovable the hand that rules metlakahtla wears a velvet glove but the hand is there within the glove just the same all the time after dr bluett duncan left dr h j minthorne with wife and daughter spent nearly three years on the island on two different occasions they are remembered and beloved for their many kindnesses and valuable services he as a doctor and his wife and daughter as teachers after an interval of one year the village had a new doctor in dr ernest r pike who with his wife spent there a honeymoon of two years from eighteen ninety nine to nineteen o one thomas boyd who had studied medicine in ireland came to act both as missionary teacher and as doctor and filled both positions to the satisfaction of all parties concerned from february nineteen o three to december nineteen o four when he on account of failing health was compelled to return to europe where he ere long died leaving an estimable wife and lovely little daughter the first white child born on annette island when mr duncan first came to alaska the government offered him assistance in the educational branch of his work and allowed him twelve hundred dollars per year with which to pay a teacher or teachers in his school when he had received this help for about six years and that it was a welcome one during those trying years we may well imagine a rule was promulgated that the bible should not be taught in any school in alaska supported by governmental aid when mr duncan learned of this he immediately refused to receive another dollar of government money the bible will not be exiled from any school that i have anything to do with he said the same grand old man this one thing i do other missionaries in alaska circumvented the order they had their bible reading and studying but at special sessions then they adjourned and walking the children around the building came in again and organized the school mr duncan was however too great a man for such tricks let the money go god would give help and he has of the white teachers who have come and gone at metlakahtla besides those already mentioned we may note mr and mrs j f mckee from pennsylvania from april to october eighteen ninety two e w wiesner and wife quakers from august eighteen ninety three to october eighteen ninety four john h hadley and wife from iowa from august to december eighteen ninety seven and miss daisy stromstedt from september one to november one nineteen o six david leask was till he died in eighteen ninety nine a great help to mr duncan in the schoolroom and during the last four or five years his daughter martha leask has been employed the greater part of the time alonzo hamlet a half-breed with a good education served as teacher in eighteen ninety seven and eighteen ninety eight i will frankly admit that of late years the children have not received the attention they should and which their fathers and mothers in their youth received from mr duncan personally his many duties make it impossible for him to personally give the time he would like to the education of the young mr duncan sees this as well as any one and he sincerely regrets that he unfortunately has been unable to help matters he hopes that different results may be expected now as he has secured the services as schoolmaster of an earnest christian gentleman mr bertram g mitchell formerly principal of the public schools in ketchikan alaska who with his wife removed to metlakahtla in august nineteen o eight but if he has had bad luck in getting schoolmasters who would make a long stay at metlakahtla he has certainly been most fortunate in having with him for all of ten years an excellent scotch couple mr and mrs james wallace 
during all these years mrs wallace has faithfully tried to make mr duncan's home as pleasant for him as it could be made by a neat and most excellent housekeeper and mr wallace has by discharging the duties of postmaster and wharfinger as well as by taking care of the excellent fruit and vegetable garden himself been a great help and comfort to mr duncan all the more pity that he after this year will miss their valuable assistance and pleasant christian society as they intend to go south and settle on their beautiful little farm near portland oregon when we do not count the schoolmasters who for the last ten years have occasionally flitted so far north for very short and limited periods mr and mrs wallace have been the only white people permitted to live at metlakahtla with the exception of an old french canadian jeremiah zure who claims to be over one hundred and five years old but who probably in fact is not over ninety-five he was at fort simpson before mr duncan married a tsimshean woman moved with the natives to old metlakahtla and also to alaska he is quite a factor on the island inasmuch as he has three children eighteen grandchildren and seventeen great-grandchildren but is hardly possessed of the sterling qualities of the natives who stand far above him in intelligence and education there were eight hundred twenty three natives who emigrated to new metlakahtla since that time a few new residents have been added to the colony but not many and a few have left some for the old place but more for other places in alaska notably ketchikan where they have a better opportunity to earn more wages the last census of the village in the summer of nineteen o eight shows a population of only six hundred eighty three this decrease in the population is mainly due to the excessive mortality rate while southeastern alaska is not an unhealthy country at all in fact some one has jocularly said that no one dies there except from accident or old age still it must be admitted that the adoption of the clothing and food of the whites by the natives does not seem to have added anything to the condition of their health and strength quite the opposite is the sad actuality tuberculosis and pulmonary troubles generally seem to be the prevailing causes of death while a couple epidemics of influenza and one of whooping cough have claimed their share of victims according to the records which however are not very complete as to the cause of death there have not been less than fifty-five deaths from the white plague out of a total of five hundred and two deaths as against only four hundred and fifty-two births recorded from the time of removal to alaska up to july first nineteen o eight footnote as no particular records of birth is kept at metlakahtla only of children brought into the church the first sunday of each year to be prayed for it is quite likely that there have been considerably many more births than here stated it is perhaps fair to estimate that at least fifty per cent of the one hundred forty six children given as have died in infancy were never so presented and that the probable true number of births would come nearer five hundred twenty five than as above given but even so this certainly shows a bad condition of things End of, footnote. of the deaths one hundred forty six were of infants one hundred six of children from two to ten years and sixty-three of adolescents from ten to twenty years old some twenty-four deaths were caused by accident mostly drowning one old woman died at an age exceeding ninety years she was married and had children before the white people first came to nass river in eighteen thirty two twenty-six of the deaths were of people between eighty and ninety twenty of between seventy and eighty the same number between sixty and seventy and twenty-six between fifty and sixty so it seems that if a native can manage to get through childhood he has a pretty fair prospect of longevity the death rate among children which is so much greater in proportion than in the settlements in the states is perhaps in a large measure due to the exposure which follows from the habit of taking their families along and camping out at their logging fishing and trapping tours but i cannot doubt that the change in the building of their houses which precludes the ventilation and constant supply of fresh air which their old mode of building with the central fireplace and the large opening in the roof for the escape of smoke insured has considerably to do with the waning health and deplorably excessive death rate among these people this state of things of course affects the parents as well as the children some remedy must certainly be found for this high mortality rate in the near future or the funeral knell of the whole race will soon be sounded 
End of chapter 38「thirty nine of the Apostle of Alaska, the story of William Duncan of Metlakatla by John W. Arctander. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. Flotsam and Jetsam. No more beautiful sight meets the eyes of an excursionist in Alaska than the vista that this little village presents on a sunlit day as the steamer approaches it what first attracts the eye is perhaps the curious little island which lies right across the entrance to the bay and very properly has been called duncan's battleship it takes very little imagination to believe when at some distance that a real battleship is anchored at the inlet to the harbour passing along one notices the beautiful little good time island as the natives call it and then looms in full sight the magnificent purple mountain which towers above the sea some twenty five hundred feet with the silvery strip of a waterfall leaping down its dizzy height from the lake in the clouds to the right and directly behind the church is yellow hill so called from its peculiar colour caused by the action of the elements on the serpentine building stone of which this immense rocky ridge consists then what first attracts the eye are the public buildings on mission street and especially the magnificent church all in glorious white coats below these buildings and nearer to the beach are strewn around in the luxurious verdure of the gardens the houses of the natives painted in all colours pink green light and dark orange lemon grey and white the latter two colours predominating no one approaching this peaceful little village doubts that it is a place of happy homes everything indicates it and if you know something about what a model village lies before you you certainly do not doubt that peace and happiness here reign supreme we assuredly can most properly call it a model village for upon inquiry we learn that in this little town a glass of liquor cannot be had for love or money that a pipe or cigar is never seen within its limits except when the tourists bring them along that one never hears there from one end of the year to the other god's name taken in vain or any oath of any kind uttered that when sunday comes the quiet and peace of the true sabbath rest over the village not an axe is lifted to chop kindling not a pail of water is carried not an oar is dipped into the sea until after the last service is over sunday night at eight thirty all of these people come as near living a consistent christian life loving each other caring for the poor and nursing the sick as any christian community in the land or for all that in any land so many people have an idea that all of alaska is a refrigerator that it may be proper here to say that the winters in this part of alaska are not at all cold the influence of the kuroshiwo or japanese current which circles around the islands prevents excessive cold as a general thing the thermometer does not go below the freezing point and as only on two or three occasions during the last twenty years it has been known to go down to zero or under so while snow lies all winter on the mountains and across clarence strait on the higher mountains of prince of wales island all summer too at metlakatla it hardly ever stays more than a day or two and it is not by any means every year that the young people can enjoy the sport of skating on the little lake back of the village but whenever the winter is cold enough to freeze the lake over skating parties are the order of the day and even a picnic party on the ice is not considered any less the proper thing than the summer picnic parties in the forests in the states on account of the mild weather in the winter there is not a plastered house in metlakatla in fact there is no necessity for it nor are there any screens protecting doors or windows as there are no mosquitoes in the summer even on a warm day in the summer the refreshing sea breezes see to it that the thermometer hardly ever climbs any higher than eighty degrees the nights following on a warm day are always refreshingly cool the climate here has however its drawbacks both in summer and winter and especially in the winter there is an enormously heavy rainfall some years it has even exceeded one hundred twenty inches in the winter time there are further very disagreeable windstorms occasionally lasting for days in succession 
when access to the harbour is almost impossible but as soon as spring comes the flowers peep forth it is not an uncommon sight to see in the metlakatla gardens anemones primroses daisies and forget-me-nots in full bloom in the first days of may yea in some earlier years at the commencement of the second half of april when even the grass in the middle west has not commenced to put on its summer coat wild flowers and wild berries grow profusely all over the island among the latter may be mentioned the salmonberry the thimbleberry the cloudberry the blueberry the blue and red huckleberry and the whortleberry the natives grow in their gardens strawberries raspberries black currants and gooseberries there are several crab apple trees and cherry trees two years ago skeins from apple trees growing on the west coast of norway under practically the same climatic conditions were imported and grafted and are now growing finely transplanted into the native gardens all sorts of vegetables especially potatoes are raised by the metlakatlans since a friend of metlakatla some four years ago commenced to give prizes every year for the best flower gardens in the village greater care has been bestowed on the gardens new fences have been procured and neatly painted flower beds have been laid out in a very artistic and original manner taking all sorts of shapes halibut starfish half moons crosses anchors and hearts in one garden a battleship was built with a rose bush climbing up through the smokestack and a little furred animal peeping up from out of the forehold rose bushes of all kinds bearing luscious roses pink red white and yellow have been procured and planted and the gardens are gay with pansies tiger lilies dahlias and peonies not to speak of daisies in all colors and forget-me-nots of the most beautiful bright blue hue much bluer than they are ever seen in the states the garden which the first year received the first prize is the only one at metlakatla which can boast of a lawn and a lawn mower the lawn party of which an illustration is found herein was given in this garden the question will naturally arise whether the interior of the houses of the natives is as attractive as the exterior my answer is that i suppose there is a great difference between the natives as among white people with regard to cleanliness neatness and taste i have seen houses at metlakatla where i would not particularly care to sit down to eat a meal but i have also been in houses there where everything was as scrupulously clean and neat as in any house of the same class of people the ordinary working class which i have ever entered in the states there are carpets on the floor in most cases linoleum fair pictures on the wall good useful furniture much bric-a-brac on the shelf over the fireplace curtains at the windows draperies at the doors musical instruments for the girls to play on while everything including the kitchen and the kettles and dishes are scrupulously clean the mere fact that there are at metlakatla two pianos and forty-six organs will give an idea of the love of these people for music and i might say right here that none of them are bought for ornament they are faithfully used wherever one is found it is the rule not the exception that the parents as well as the children over twelve or thirteen years of age can and do play on it the metlakatla brass band of thirty pieces is well known all over southeastern alaska in nineteen o four it contrary to mr duncan's advice made a concert tour covering some of the pacific coast cities owing to poor management the boys lost money on the tour for which they had bought new silver-plated instruments at an expense of over two thousand dollars but those who heard them were full of admiration for the native talent in addition to the brass band there is at metlakatla a reed band a string band an orchestra a ladies orchestra and a girls zobo band the church choir consisting of twenty-four members comprises some very beautiful voices a captain of one of the visiting warships once said to mr duncan after hearing the congregational singing in the church on sunday why you have the voices of prima donnas here and i am not surprised at the remark i have heard in the church in this village voices so sweet and clear that i can well understand that proper cultivation could produce a counterpart of a patty's or a melba's wonderful register many of the young people play several different instruments 
there are no less than four men and one woman among them who can handle the pipe organ in the church very effectually mr haldane i have heard play on the piano with great skill and feeling difficult compositions of grieg tchaikowsky brahms and chopin which he had never laid eyes on or heard before mrs lucy a booth the best soprano among them reads music readily and sings the score at once without practice the old simpian love song which is here reproduced is one of her favorite songs and was sung by her before mr haldane who wrote the music for me from her singing the canoe song which is also here reproduced is an old national song of theirs and was sung for me by john tate almost all tsimshean men and women are born actors and speakers even in ordinary conversation their soft flowing speech is accompanied by a mimicry and a gesticulation which makes one almost feel that one understands the strange language falling from their lips public speaking with the men seems to come as naturally as singing to the women their delivery is very effective never ranting often indeed it is pathetic and pleading their flow of language is continuous you never hear one stutter or stammer or hesitate they impress you as being full of their subject whether speaking on religious or secular matters and as being earnest and honest in what they have to tell you the modulation is wonderful the gesticulation is never extravagant many times indeed it is exceedingly persuasive and always natural the imagery of the native eloquence is something remarkable in its simple beauty it is always strictly correct let me give one example taken from a religious exhortation by george usher now deceased brethren and sisters you know the eagle and its ways the eagle flies high the eagle rests high it always rests on the highest branch of the highest tree we should be like the eagle we should rest on the highest branch of the highest tree that branch is jesus christ when we rest on him all our enemies will be below and far beneath us mr duncan says that he has never heard even a little child among them speak ungrammatically the tsimsians are great lovers of all athletic sports an inclination which mr duncan from an early day thought it well to encourage the metlakatla baseball nine is easily the champion team in southeastern alaska of late years have been formed the second and third team there is also at metlakatla a football team governor swineford soon after the metlakatlans came to alaska encouraged mr duncan in forming and drilling a company of volunteers and promised to furnish uniforms and accoutrements in compliance with this request the metlakatla volunteers were formed and drilled assiduously for more than two years when the governor informed mr duncan that the judge of the district had decided that he could not legally encourage a company of volunteers among them inasmuch as they were not citizens whereupon the company was regretfully disbanded i have already in a footnote stated that the tsimshean calls his cousins on the mother's side brothers and sisters and treats them as such even to this day no tsimshean with a proper regard for the ancient rule will marry any one of his mother's clan or totem do not be surprised should you visit one of them if he after having introduced you to his mother says and this is my mother and again and this is also my mother all of his aunts his mother's sisters are his mothers that is the explanation another peculiarity even to this day a woman is most generally not spoken of in the village as mrs so-and-so if her first child's name is emma the name that the mother goes by is nos emma emma's mother her husband generally is nuvoad emma emma's father if they have no children but happen to have a pet in the family like a dog they are spoken of as the father and mother of the dog naming it mr and mrs wallace for instance being a childless couple were among the natives generally designated as nugwa molly and nos daisy respectively as they saw mr wallace milk and take care of molly mr duncan's cow and mrs wallace invariably feeding little daisy molly's calf i will give a few of the most common words in tsimshian Nyash is the common name for either wife or husband grandfather is neyash grandmother is nishits nuwado is my father 
du guanum is our father a grandchild is talu tong grandchildren tluk laghut any one might know what a word like klem shu maknak must mean something really bad it is tsimshian for mother-in-law kemukum chust is the word for the sun kemukum akt is for the moon the heater of the day and of the night kemuk is heat kemukum is the adjective pot so kemukum akst is hot water while simply warm water is spot kum akst and cold water guat kum akst from guat the word for chill and coldness when the tsimshian wants to tell you that it is a hot day he will say kamukum sha the expression for all day or the whole day is uya sha sha kat katum coffee means strong coffee but kat katum oxt is tsimshian for whiskey another name for strong drink is lamb really applied originally only to rum the tsimshian calls spring kohim summer shud autumn fishkut and winter kwam shum when a tsimshian wants to be very polite in greeting you he will say endo willa wan how do you do but ordinarily he will simply inquire ah lan willa wam are you well and you may with great propriety answer am willa walu i am well they have no word for thanks or thank you there is one word for an adjective in the singular and a different word for its plural for instance while hot water is kemukum oxt as stated hot potatoes are lemukum shushid strong man is kat ketum yuat strong men kataletum yuata the same is the case with verbs for instance stand in the singular is heich in the plural Maxt. I stand is Heit Kanu. He stands Heit Ka. We stand Makshum. They stand Makshida. I will here subjoin for the benefit of the reader the Lord's Prayer and the Apostolic Benediction in Tsimshian given in the Metlakatla Church Manual. The Lord's Prayer. We nagwadum ku tsim la chaga nklutish ak nuwant shahakshya nsabani shakhod khan tumwal al hal tsohami newot katsim lakha ga kinam klagam asha kwa amshkabu winaya kam kwadan a nah achtakami nehwal da di wila kam kwadamam a hach hakak adigam Kelomza tatyank umpt shpait tin shpalt quadumpt ara ma al tilak mauktum aha akhadat a will natsab bandat ara nakat ketandat tilten clodant ara tum kla willawal amen the apostolic benediction na Amsk me ya num Jesus Christ tum kla willa hoshk din gam tilth ni shibanshk shimauket kar la kaga kanel amt kite amen the tsimshian has a superstitious aversion to pronouncing his own name and will never give it unless it is absolutely necessary if two or more children are together and you should ask the name of one of them he will look foolish as if he did not understand you and throw a beseeching glance at the others one of whom will after the proper pause help him out of the difficulty by giving his name the first one will very likely return the favour for the other the same superstition prevents a parent from giving the age of a child or the date of its birth to figure out anything like this might make the child die it is very touching to see these people's affection for their children it is carried to such an extent that they often are in danger of spoiling them when a child is sick and mr duncan on inquiry finds out that it has been given something to eat which it ought not to have had and asks the mother what made you let her have that the answer invariably is she wanted it sir that seems to settle the matter in the mother's mind 
an echo of the old potlatch practice may be found in the peculiarity of the metlakatlan when giving you a present always look for a present in return they keep strict account of their gifts and of their expectations an old man one day came to mr duncan and asked his help to collect twenty dollars from a party in british columbia upon inquiry as to the nature of the debt mr duncan ascertained that the old man thirty years ago gave the woman's mother since deceased on her wedding day a cloak of the value of twenty dollars and as the mother never had given him any equivalent return present he perceived that he now had a valid claim for the value of his gift against the daughter who on her mother's decease had become possessed of her property as to the metlakatlan's faces and general appearance i prefer to let the photographs given in the present book speak for themselves as to their manner of dress it may be said that the men are clothed just about like men of the same class in the states the women especially the young women are perhaps a little inclined to wear gaudier hats and a little brighter shirt waists than the white people of the same social condition but not much more so many of them exhibit very good taste indeed the very old women generally wear shawls and on their heads black silk kerchiefs tied under the chin which give them a very sedate and modest appearance it is remarkable how well most of these people both men and women carry their age women whom at first sight i should have judged to be young women of between thirty and forty on inquiry turned out to be grandmothers of over fifty i know a number of men over sixty years of age without a gray hair in their heads and who easily would pass as being under forty gray hairs are a matter of very rare occurrence among them anyhow only now and then will you see a person of very advanced age with a gray head the men have as a general thing not very much of a hirsute adornment now and then we find a scanty mustache there are only two full beards in the village among the natives and they are not of a very luxurious growth i have heard this explained by a custom prevalent more especially in earlier times of pulling out the hairs of the face as they were first showing themselves it is remarkable to see the smallness of the hands and feet especially of the women another noticeable feature about these people is their well-preserved teeth while the teeth are generally ground down especially among the older people more than they would be among the whites there are very few mouths with decaying teeth there is still more interference on the part of parents and relatives in the way of matchmaking than there ought to be but mr duncan has to a great extent done away with it when he has an idea that a woman is unduly influenced to marry some one he acts as he did in the case of a young woman whose parents asked him to marry her to an old man he called her alone to his office and asked her do you want to marry that old man my parents sir i did not ask if your parents wanted you to i knew they did what i want to know is if you want it they say i must sir they have promised him do you love him no sir do you like anybody else i don't know sir this was with quite an amount of hesitation well you don't like him in any event no i do not well then you shall not marry him either so that match which evidently was not made in heaven was broken off i need not say that divorces are wholly unknown in metlakatla practically all the natives at metlakatla are common workmen fishermen trappers loggers and workers in the sawmill or cannery but some of them are carrying on a private business of their own thus there are five small native stores and two restaurants in the village two blacksmith shops two silversmiths two photographers two expert wood carvers several carpenters six or seven boat builders and one young native man operates a remington typewriter a good many of the older women make baskets and mats out of cedar bark for the tourists the patterns for the mats are quite varied and many of them are very neat and attractive in basket making the tsimshian women have however not acquired either the dexterity or the taste nor do they use the fine materials of the Tlingit and haida women especially the latter who are experts in this art when the tsimshians came to alaska their conveyance on the water was the canoe mr duncan says that years ago he counted at one time twenty-eight new canoes building on the beach 
a canoe is now a curiosity and is no longer employed at metlakatla the natives have learned to build the white man's boat and prefer it as being both stronger cheaper and safer the columbia river sailing boat has been the style of late years and there are not fewer than thirty-five of them owned in the village but very lately it seems that the gasoline launch is coming to the front also among the natives at this place there are now nine gasoline launches owned at metlakatla all with the exception of two of quite a good size most of them are each thirty-five or forty feet long with from seven to eight foot beam and supplied with good and reliable engines it is on the water that these natives are especially masters of the situation their nautical skill is marvellous while their knowledge of the channels everywhere in southeastern alaska is well nigh perfect they use but do not need charts in their opinion there are still too many errors in them too many rocks and reefs not yet located and they are right i went in the summer of nineteen o eight on a cruise of five hundred miles with two of these natives in waters wholly new to one of them the other had not visited them for over twenty years but his memory never failed him and he had no use for my chart after he found that a certain rock awash at high tide and which he had told me about was not marked on the map in ten minutes we came to the place and there was the rock all right as it had been twenty years ago to my surprise i found that the little craft was not furnished with a compass and still we always found our way over large expanses of open water as well as in narrow channels where the tide swirls were running wild good sailors good fishers and trappers good workmen and even good mechanics as they are these natives all seem to be lacking in executive ability and as business men they are not a success several enterprises undertaken by some of them away from the island have been signal failures so have some of their small stores and widows and others who confided to them their little savings under hope and promise of big returns have not only failed to harvest the profits but have lost their capital invested as well and this through no dishonesty of purpose on the part of the enterprisers but wholly for the lack of business energy and ability to carry on the undertaking on proper business lines another fault with a good many of these people is their inability to appreciate the necessity of exactness accuracy and completeness a native seldom is on time for an appointment when a house is built there is generally something left unfinished i am inclined to think that these are defects which a more finished education and a generation or two of business training will wholly eradicate the fact remains that these natives in the way of work seem to be able to do everything they see others do at least when properly instructed that they are able to complete such complex building undertakings as the two large churches built by mr duncan at both of the metlakatlas with the limited apparatus and appliances at hand without a single mishap or accident certainly speaks volumes for their ability as mere workmen and mechanics a stranger cannot fail to be impressed by their excessive politeness and good manners they always knock at the door before entering they always remove their caps or hats when coming into mr duncan's office and address him with marked deference to ladies and to white men whom they know and respect they invariably doff their hats on the street the other day i noticed the amiable clerk in mr duncan's store a man over sixty years old respectfully doff his cap in saying good-bye to a little golden-haired white girl only about two years old who had just bought five cents worth of candy from him dropping into mr duncan's store one day in august nineteen o eight i found several natives present listening to a phonograph which was reeling off some columbia records i was engaged in an interesting conversation with the rev mr tomlinson and paid no particular attention to what tune was played until i saw the hats and caps of all these uncouth laborers and fishermen come off quickly i looked up in surprise then it struck me that it was the star-spangled banner that was being played these natives who were not yet american citizens had shamed me in paying homage to our country and its flag end of chapter thirty nine chapter forty of the apostle of alaska the story of william duncan of metlakatla by john w arctander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil Schempf the metlakatla industries 
mr duncan's books show that the sum total of the business transacted in his industrial enterprises at metlakahtla covering the store the sawmill and the cannery from the beginning in eighteen eighty seven up to the first of july nineteen o eight was not less than nine hundred thousand nine hundred and thirty seven dollars and thirty one cents from these gross proceeds he has during the same time paid in wages to the natives the sum of four hundred and eighty one thousand forty three dollars the difference between these sums does not of course represent the profits of the enterprise out of the gross proceeds the stock and the store every year renewed must be paid also tin and soldering materials for the millions of cans for the cannery boats nets machinery lacquering materials and labels heavy freight bills insurance of the pack at seattle no insurance premiums being paid at metlakahtla and a liberal commission to the house handling and selling the pack during all these years mr duncan has not only been the preacher and pastor and most of the time the only physician of the village without pay or hire and to a certain extent at least schoolmaster of the young but also the manager bookkeeper timekeeper general overseer and cashier of this extensive business and in addition to all this he is the counsellor of every man woman and child the arbiter of all their little troubles the comforter in their sorrows and adversity the adviser on all matters of policy economy and health both private and public the sawmill and planing mill by employing loggers as well as sawyers and mill hands have contributed a good deal towards furnishing many in the village with their means of subsistence but it is on the cannery that mr duncan mainly relies for employing the idle hands of the village at a fair compensation it is a great pity that this business can be carried on only for a short time during the year the canning process is practically limited to two months july and august when the salmon are running as it is called for the benefit of those who know nothing about the life and habits of the salmon let me explain the salmon is hatched in some freshwater lake the headwaters of some little stream where the spawn is deposited after living for some months in this lake the young salmon gradually works its way down the stream towards the ocean and disappears no one knows where it goes to or where it dwells only this is known in four years it attains full size it then returns by thousands yea by millions to the same stream leading to the same lake where it was once hatched footnote how is it able to find the exact way through thousands of miles of ocean how can it locate the stream whence it came how can it distinguish it from others just like it no one has attempted to explain but it is a settled fact each stream in alaska has its peculiar salmon coming to it and up it and no other young salmon have been marked and found to return to their native lake never in a single instance has a marked salmon been found in the wrong stream what a lesson in the guiding force of an almighty power End of footnote. it gradually works its way up the stream jumping up the waterfalls from rock to rock often leaping as high as seven feet in one jump sometimes the first effort fails then it tries and tries again until successful onward and upward it progresses until it reaches the breeding ground in its native lake sore and torn dishevelled and disfigured from its rocky path from its enervating exhausting efforts to get there when arriving at the spawning ground the first work undertaken is that of the male burrowing with its nose and pushing his body again and again into the sand he makes deep furrows so after a while the spawning ground looks as if a plough had gone over it then comes the turn of the female she places herself in the furrow and deposits the spawn the male then fertilizes it this done she covers it with her wriggling tail with sand the life work of the salmon is now ended and it is ready to die these lakes soon become filled with putrid fish emitting such an odor that it is almost impossible to approach them some of the salmon have life enough left to wriggle themselves down the stream but most of these die before they reach the ocean those that do get back die there and are washed ashore by the tide 
it is when approaching these their native streams in large shoals the salmon are caught in nets or seines or traps by the fishermen and brought to the canneries some time after they have touched fresh water varying according to the distance they have to travel upstream they become soft and flabby and unfit to eat in the different streams the estuaries of which the cannery at metlakatla draws upon for its salmon there are four different kinds of salmon running the red salmon the sockeye in tsimshian mesho the medium red salmon the coho in tsimshian gua the pink salmon or the humpback in tsimshian shtamaun and the white salmon called chum or dog salmon in tsimshian kanish the latter though a very good salmon but not so fat as the others is put up only in a very limited extent at metlakatla japan has been the single market for it until lately when it has with considerable success been introduced in the south where it seems to suit better as the hot climate makes a dry fish preferable to an oily one the first work done in a cannery is in the spring and early summer when the cans are manufactured as the capacity of the machinery at metlakatla enables it to pack twenty thousand cases of salmon consisting of forty-eight pound cans each nearly one million tin cans must first be made also twenty thousand boxes of planed boards this work employs a force of about one hundred men and boys for about two months at wages varying from one to two dollars per day immediately after the fourth of july the fishermen are started out with their boats and nets and the steamers make their daily rounds of from forty to seventy miles to gather up the salmon catch and bring it to the cannery there it first goes through the hands of the cutters who remove the head tail and fins and disembowel the fish it is then turned over to the cleaners who clean it thoroughly in two running waters whereupon it is cut up into proper lengths on a machine and delivered in trays to the women who put it in cans the cans after being filled are wiped clean and a spring cover put on them then the cover is soldered and the cans put in the boiler for the first cooking after this first cooking a hole is punched in each can to allow all the air to escape then the hole is immediately filled up again with solder and the can replaced in the boiler for its second cooking after being thoroughly cleaned and all grease and oil removed they are allowed to cool they are then thoroughly tested by experts who tap each can and by the sound can determine if there is a leak in any one can all leaks are set aside and carefully examined until the leak is found when it is closed with solder in most canneries the cans are now at once lacquered labelled and marketed not so at metlakatla the lacquer will often temporarily close a leak after a while however the leak reappears and the result is a more or less spoilt can of salmon when it reaches the consumer in order to obviate this the cans at metlakatla are after cooling piled up till the season is over then they are again tested new leaks closed up and then and only then are they lacquered and labelled put into cases and made ready for the steamer to be by it carried to the commission house in seattle kelly clark and company who finally dispose of them to the wholesale trade the entire work in the cannery at metlakatla is done by the indians under the constant supervision of mr duncan from early morn till late at night the people who do the work are scrupulously clean none other are allowed to handle the salmon tables floors and trays are scoured and cleaned thoroughly every day so that after a day's work is done one on peeking into the cannery would not know but that it was one's own kitchen he was poking his nose into there are canneries where putrid salmon is put into cans the chinese are under contract to fill them and they have no very bothersome consciences of course mr duncan could not tolerate such conduct for a moment in his cannery once in a while one comes across to sick salmon this can always be discovered by the touch of the human hand in most canneries the filling is done by machinery which of course takes the salmon whether it be sick or well not so at metlakatla any piece from a sick salmon is at once discarded and goes into a pail under the table then again a time comes when the salmon becomes flabby and not in prime condition 
this is towards the end of the season when the salmon is running the strongest as soon as this is the case mr duncan closes his cannery not another salmon is allowed to be canned i have known seasons where he closes his cannery quite fourteen days earlier than any one of the other canneries in that part of the world it is his ambition that every can of metlakatla salmon shall be up to its reputation as the best salmon canned in alaska we can form an idea of the honesty and care with which his mr duncan's business is transacted all through when we hear that every can when filled is placed upon a pair of scales on the other scale of which is a tin can with a pound weight in it every can must tip that scale if it does not it is returned to the filler for more salmon and then weighed again before it is accepted he is bound to give an honest pound of salmon in every can there is your old genuine yorkshire business honesty for you some years ago a friend of mine from minneapolis came to metlakatla on the spokane after having made a tour of alaska after we had been around and inspected the buildings and the church he mentioned that after having visited the salmon canneries he had made up his mind never to eat another meal of canned salmon he could not do it have you been through the cannery here no i took him along it so happened that the entire force was at work and i let him thoroughly inspect the whole process from beginning to end when we went down to the dock he said i am glad you showed me this i will make an exception of metlakatla salmon but i will eat no other neither do i the brands manufactured at metlakatla are one the mission brand red salmon two the metlakatla brand medium red salmon and three the buckle brand pink salmon they all have on the label somewhere packed by the metlakatla industrial company at metlakatla alaska as the label of the old corporation has not been changed the total pack from eighteen ninety one to the end of the season in nineteen o seven was two hundred and forty seven thousand three hundred forty four cases or nearly twelve million cans a manufactured product from over six thousand tons of salmon the fishermen employed by mr duncan and they are of course all metlakatlans are paid by the fish and can earn from three to five dollars per day i have seen as many as ten thousand salmon handled in one day the last of the salmon being ready for the first boiling in ten hours the women filling cans are also paid by the piece and can make from two to two dollars and fifty cents a day the cutters the cleaners the men around the boilers and the testers are paid wages of from two to three dollars per day the women who wipe the cans get one dollar per day the girls who put the covers on them an equal sum and boys working at different jobs piling cans etc from fifty to seventy-five cents per day as very often three or four members of a family are employed the total earnings are quite a bit even if the season is short the total number on the payroll during the canning season proper varies from one hundred and eighty to two hundred and fifty in nineteen o eight it was only one hundred and eighty five until the pack is sold or at least until new year mr duncan pays his employees only in coupons good at his general store at new year any balance coming to them is paid in cash this year he has promised his people to introduce the profit-sharing element in his cannery business if there is any profit from the pack which is not a certainty by any means as for three years in succession some years ago the business proved an absolute loss he will after the season distribute one half of the net profits between the cannery employees including the fishermen in proportion to the wages earned by them already as all the inhabitants of metlakatla cannot find employment in its industries a number seek work at other places at canneries and sawmills especially during the summer season what mr duncan is looking for and hopes to accomplish in time is the operation of so many additional industries and such extension of those already going that the whole population can find steady employment on the island all the year round small as their wages are and limited as the capacity for employment is yet a good many of the metlakatlans have managed to save quite a little sum from their earnings one of their number not long ago consulted me in regard to the most profitable investment of two thousand dollars and several of them to my knowledge have a few hundred dollars laid by End of chapter forty
Chapter 41 of The Apostle of Alaska The Story of William Duncan of Metlakatla by John W. Arctander This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf The Christian Church as the life of the Metlakatlans centers round and has its foundation in the religion of the Christ, so naturally every interest in the little village clusters around and culminates in the church. It naturally dominates all and everything. The official name of the Church of Metlakatla is simply the Christian Church of Metlakatla. It and its members belong to no sect or denomination. It is strictly an undenominational evangelical church. Its whole creed is found on the beautifully inlaid pulpit, on the ribbon held in the bill of the white dove, God is love, and in the glad gospel message surmounting its preaching platform. The angel saith unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day, in the city of David, a Saviour, which is Christ the Lord. In this pulpit is welcomed any evangelical preacher, and from its platform have spoken to the people of Metlakatla, Bishop Rowe, the efficient and indefatigable head of the Episcopal Church of Alaska, as well as Methodist, Baptist, Congregational, Presbyterian, and Lutheran ministers and laymen. The only condition exacted is that they preach no ism, but only the pure, simple gospel message of Jesus the Christ crucified. It may, in this connection, be interesting to read Mr. Duncan's views on the propriety and expediency of non-sectarianism in heathen missions. He says, I hold that it would be well if all missionaries, on leaving their several societies to preach the gospel to the heathen, would leave their respective church colors behind them and take their stand in heathen lands under but one and the same banner the banner of christ if this were done we would i believe not only have less strife and rivalry ill success and hollowness in mission work but we would have more reality more progress and more victory divisions among religious teachers are sad stumbling blocks to the heathen bad enough to have divisions at home but far worse to carry them abroad to fetter and worry new converts while in the weakness of their pupilage if however denominational differences must ultimately arise among the new converts to divide them as they have divided us then let at least such divisions be inaugurated by themselves and be attributable to diversity of thought and choice as with us as far as we are concerned let them remain united as long as they can and divide only when necessity from within demands it it seems to me worthy of the best sympathies of the christians at home to foster the desire of newly formed congregations in heathen lands for church unity in their respective countries and nothing less than simple unmitigated cruelty to try to divide them for the glory of any church denomination or party these were his sentiments when he first left england fifty years ago he was animated by them in his opposition to clapping the manacles of the church of england on his new converts and to this day he is true to the convictions of his youth and has faithfully carried them out in the church formation rather than church organization at metlakatla three times a day every sabbath do the church bells of metlakatla call upon the people to attend divine service the morning service is at eleven thirty it is a great sight sunday morning to see the walks black with people from all directions they are coming men women and children as the people are entering the church with solemn mien and stolid faces while the bells are still pealing out their message of invitation to one and all a prelude is played on the fine pipe organ thus far the only one in alaska as the last sound of the bell is dying away in the stillness and peace of the place mr duncan clothed in a black prince albert coat without even a white tie or any other clerical vestment or adornment ascends the preaching platform and kneels down for silent prayer behind the reading desk a hymn is then sung in simpsian by the congregation which always rises in singing 
thereupon mr duncan kneeling in the pulpit after saying in english let us pray offers an earnest prayer in tsimshian the congregation all kneeling in their seats at the conclusion of this prayer which usually takes about five minutes the audience joins with him in the lord's prayer also in tsimshian thereupon he closes with the apostolic benediction the congregation now sings a song from pentecostal hymns numbers one and two whereupon the church choir consisting of twenty-four excellent voices gives an anthem mr duncan rises approaches the reading desk and again kneels down for a very short simple prayer in english the audience also again kneeling he thereupon reads in english the text which in the forenoon always is in the international sunday school lesson the audience following him in their bibles then he begins his sermon always in tsimshian he first paraphrases the portion of the scriptures read in tsimshian taking pains to make it very plain to his people and then gives them the message which god's word has for them on that day the benign face of the inspired teacher fairly beams as in a solemn benediction it seems to be lit up by the light from heaven and as he explains and reproves consoles and praises and points to god's help the animated face and his impressive gesticulation change so that one even though not understanding a word of the language seems to be able to follow him in his exposition and after listening to him one well understands the wonderful hold he has on his people and how they never tire of hearing him expound the gospel message in fact so pronounced are his earnestness sincerity and solemnity in speech as well as in prayer coupled with the most serene simplicity that i was not surprised to hear mr wallace remark that he felt more edified by hearing him in tsimshian a language he did not understand than by hearing many ministers preach in english after a sermon of about three quarters of an hour he again says let us pray and all kneel for a short prayer at the conclusion of which he as well as the audience remains kneeling for a fraction of a minute in silent prayer the audience now files out quietly and solemnly with the word of god so forcibly imprinted on their minds and in their hearts reflected in their solemn faces there is no chatting no visiting among these church members either at the church or on the way home you can see in their faces and in their reverential demeanor that god's word has not been spoken to them in vain there is no room for levity it is mr duncan's plan that nothing shall intervene after the word has been sent home to their hearts for that reason he never allows at the morning service any closing hymn it was the same idea which when he at an early day itinerated around and preached the gospel in their different villages causing him to order his men to have his canoe ready so he could start immediately after the service had closed he did not want to give them any opportunity for familiarity or for fraternizing with him he wanted to leave the message and remove the messenger from their minds in the afternoon at three thirty the natives have their own service in the church while mr duncan gathers around him in the schoolroom the smaller children all under twelve years of age to a number all the way from ninety to one hundred and fifty according to the season and personally conducts their sabbath school service on saturday night he always meets for an hour the sunday school teachers and goes over with them the lesson for the next day explaining and expounding and advising them how best to teach it so that they are duly prepared for their duties the next day the native's own service is conducted by one of the elders chosen by his fellows for each service the leader gives out a hymn from the pentecostal hymns and offers a prayer in tsimshian the classes then separate and the lesson is studied by each a photograph of the women sunday school teachers at metlakatla is found on a nearby page upon reconvening the leader makes a short address on the golden text also in tsimshian another hymn is sung in english and the meeting closes with prayer by one of the other elders only to be reconvened again in a few minutes for what is called the young people's gospel hymn song service 
and now the tsimshian love of song and music has a feast it is most edifying to see with what vim and feeling they sing one after the other their favorite gospel hymns and at almost every service a new one is added to the list which makes their hearts swell and their voices rise mightily to the throne of god in song and praise at seven thirty the church bell again calls these devoted people this time to the evening service at which there is the singing of a hymn in english a prayer by mr duncan in simshian and a short address in the same language on some subject selected by him from the scriptures then the doxology is sung and one of the elders selected for that purpose while all the congregation is kneeling from his pew leads in a closing prayer the congregation solemnly and reverently disperses and the sabbath at metlakatla is over later on one hears the organs in the different houses and gospel hymns continue to be sung in the homes until ten o'clock which is the recognized hour of rest in the village on sunday evenings mr duncan generally takes up a series of discourses the summer of nineteen o eight it was the parables which furnished the theme on wednesday evening is held the midweek service attended by all of the more earnest christians at the place for of course there are here as everywhere those who are more earnest in their christian life and those who are lagging behind it lasts about an hour and is opened with one of the old well-known hymns in english a short prayer and address in simshian follow then the closing prayer by one of the natives for a couple of years the epistles of st peter were taken up at these meetings then the psalms in the year nineteen o eight the miracles of christ furnish the subject for devotional consideration mr duncan has never at any time made any translation of the bible or any part of it into their language he has such pious veneration for the old king james version that he can only think of an attempt to transfer it into their tongue as an absolute mutilation of the holy word bishop ridley at an early day with the assistance of a female native made a rather abortive attempt at translating into tsimshian the book of common prayer but mr duncan claims that the translation is more than useless half of the time it is absolutely meaningless to the tsimshians and what they can understand of it partakes rather of the ridiculous than of the sublime in its awkward expressions of the holy thoughts several natives at metlakatla who have tried to use the book fully agree with him in his views in this regard anyone looking at the illustration on a nearby page of the interior of the church at metlakatla will undoubtedly believe that the large book above the preaching platform inscribed holy bible is carved in wood from whatever point in the pews it is looked at it has all the appearance of a book perfectly carved in wood but this is an optical illusion caused by the native painter's art and makes it really a greater work of art than if it had been carved for it is nothing but a flat piece of board properly painted and shaded the paintings in the two fields of the front wall like everything in the church except the pipe organ and the gas fixtures are the work of the natives one depicts the announcement of the angels to the shepherds at bethlehem of the joyous event of the birth of the christ the other the visit of the magi to the christ child in the background bathed in the rays of the star loom up the walls and the houses of the little city of bethlehem it should be noted that neither of the natives who had produced these works have had any instruction in painting or for that in drawing their handiwork is simply the result of raw native talent the inlaid work on the pulpit is very tasteful in the rear of the church near the entrance door is fastened on the wall a memorial tablet in polished marble recording the loss to the church of david leask for many years one of its elders and already frequently mentioned in these pages as one of mr duncan's most valued assistants among the natives undoubtedly it will be interesting to see what stand mr duncan and his church now take on the administration of the two sacraments so long the subject of vital difference between him and the society as i have felt that on this subject i should if possible secure mr duncan's views in his own language i some time ago wrote and asked him to give them to me and i here reproduce his answer to my letter 
prefacing it however with the remark that some short time after removing to american alaska when he thought the people had attained the proper understanding of its importance he introduced among them the sacrament of the lord's supper in the modified form in which it is now administered and that he invariably uses the unfermented wine it may here be stated that the main reason why he never would consent to the administration of this sacrament among the natives under the form and ritual prescribed by the anglican church and by a priest arrayed in his robes and vestments was that he was afraid and certainly not without good reason that it would too much partake of and remind the indians of the powers and practices of their old medicine men who apparelled in their blankets were nothing but ordinary men with ordinary power but upon assuming their robes headdresses necklaces and rattles became in the indian mind endowed with superhuman miraculous ability mr duncan says as i believe that faith in christ should precede baptism and as there is no definite command or warrant to baptize children we do not have infant baptism i know that some good people regard the ceremony of infant baptism as an act of dedicating their children to god to this i reply we can dedicate assuredly to god what will obey our will but not that which can resist our will having a will of its own king david of old could and did dedicate his gold to god and the gold was used for god's temple but if he ever undertook to dedicate absalom to god he lived to see and mourn over his failure each individual has a will which none not even the father or mother can command but only the possessor and without the exercise of that will religious service is but mockery what however can we do for children is what was done for the children who were brought to christ and received his blessing the disciples at that time were baptizing more people than john the baptist we are told but surely if children were being admitted as well as adults the disciples would not have been guilty of the mistake they made when they rebuked those who brought the children we too can bring children to christ for his blessing for he is present now with his church where two or three are met together in his name and this we do at metlakatla generally on the first sunday of the year the parents after a meeting with me in which the importance of this step is impressed on them bring those of their children born during the past year to church at our morning service a special prayer is offered to god in behalf of these little ones and each child thereupon receives a card to commemorate the occasion as follows our lord jesus christ said suffer little children to come unto me you blank when an infant were brought into the church at metlakatla alaska on the day of blank a d nineteen o blank and a prayer was offered on your behalf remember this as you grow in years and follow on to know the lord jesus christ whom to know is life eternal when the children arrive at maturity a class of catechumens is started in which they are especially instructed in the essential truths of christ's religion and their duty to accept him and join the church by baptism impressed upon them whereupon those who desire to be are baptized when i while in british columbia objected to the administration of the lord's supper to the natives one of the reasons was that i felt persuaded that the man-made additions to the ordinance which the ritual of the church imposed would mislead and prove to be a curse rather than a blessing to the natives in their infantile condition as christians i cannot shut my eyes to the sad fact that out of and around the administration of the sacrament not out of the partaking of it have arisen the greatest errors and the bitterest strife which have cursed and torn the christian church and i did not want to see these errors springing up in metlakatla while i had influence to keep them out after the settlement of our people in alaska we added this christian ordinance to our church service but we keep it in the simplicity of its inauguration i recognize the ordinance to be simply a memorial and christians are to partake of it but i see no authority for it to be administered by a priest we have a very solemn and simple service after my address to the people on some scripture bearing on the service i step down and take my seat among the congregation four elders then go to the table 
and while they stand before it i read the words from the scripture which our lord used when he instituted the ordinance the elders then take plates of bread and hand them to the communicants where they are seated after the bread is received each communicant kneels in silent prayer the wine in four vessels is dealt with in the same way when all have partaken in this way i resume my place at the desk and we join in a hymn of praise and this is followed by prayer by one of the elders this takes place three times a year only at evening service to which none come but those who desire to participate in the communion service end of chapter forty one chapter forty two of the apostle of alaska the story of william duncan of metlakatla by john w arctander this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf the grand old man the fame of the mission of metlakatla has traveled all over alaska and it is now generally recognized as the only successful missionary undertaking in all the great northland even those in alaska who have no use for churches and no faith in missionaries priests or ministers make an exception of father duncan as he is generally called in the great northwest the roughest miner the most godless gambler the most errant infidel will take his hat off to him that is merely an evidence of the general respect with which a great unselfish but successful christian man and his accomplishments inspire everybody even though they be not believing christians if mr duncan should be asked for his views as to why metlakatla has proven such a contrast to the pronounced failures surrounding it he would undoubtedly after having insisted on giving god the glory first and last say first i have always from the first given these natives the gospel message in their own language i would never speak to them either through an interrupter or in the trading jargon footnote his way of spelling interpreter End footnote. second i have kept out all sex and denominational rule we are simply christians nothing else at metlakatla the word of god has united us not split us up into parties and we love and treat all evangelical christians as our brethren third by removing those who came under the influence of the gospel away from heathen and bad white influences and by as much as possible keeping them and their children uncontaminated by bad associations to this i would like to add a further reason for the success of metlakatla viz fourth the combination so rare that it becomes almost miraculous of an excellent christian preacher filled with the holy ghost and a first-class practical business man in the person of the missionary in charge mr duncan has naturally after his sad experience no use for missionary societies or missionary boards according to his idea successful missions fostered under their care come to exist not propter hoc nor even post hoc but in spite of hoc his conception of an ideal mission is one conducted by a practical god-fearing missionary selected from the midst of a christian congregation and supported by it or at the most by two or three congregations who conclude to do this work together he thinks that with direct communication thus continuously existing between the congregation and preferably between individual members of it and the missionary far better results will be obtained than by the present complex machinery which naturally has a tendency to foster a spirit of intervention dictatorialness and short authority in the executive board which must have anything but a healthy effect on the growth of a christian mission some way or another mr duncan always makes me think of paul the apostle to the gentiles not only in his metal make-up and splendid determination but in his appearance there is something that reminds me of the picture i carry in my mind of the great apostle short of stature stocky a strong bald head a full white beard sparkling bright blue eyes and ruddy cheeks like a bonny country lassie there is such a virility such courage and such youthful power emanating from him that it seems almost incredible that the snows of seventy-six winters have fallen on his devoted head when you observe the erect carriage the elastic step 
the almost electric activity and when the fire of the sparkling laughing eyes lights yours and you hear the sonorous persuasive voice relating some interesting incident in his wonderful life you simply refuse to believe that any more than at the outside fifty years can have been so far the span of his life you fully believe him when he tells you that he has never been sick in bed for a day in his long life he is indeed a walking evangel of the simple life and shows it in every feature no one who has enjoyed the privilege of sitting under the spell of his conversational powers will ever be able to forget the impression made upon him and if that is the case with us who have only heard him converse in english what must it be to those who can understandingly listen when he converses in tsimshian the language in which he himself says he both thinks and dreams his great kindness is writ in large letters all over his face and the glad smiles of the children of metlakatla when they come into the sunshine of his eyes bear witness to it mr and mrs wallace tell me that during the ten years they have lived with him as everyday companions year in and year out he has never spoken a cross word a man with a temper as sweet as that ought to be married but he has thought otherwise and is a confirmed old bachelor one evening four years ago as we sat one moonlit night on the veranda and a spell of reminiscence came over him i suppose he said that if any one when he was twenty years of age or so should have told him that he would live his life as an old bachelor and never get married he would have laughed heartily at their ignorance i had my friends and acquaintances among the young ladies he said and while i probably never was what you would call really in love there were some i liked very well indeed i always enjoyed lady society and do to this day during the first ten or even twenty years of my sojourn among the indians my friends in victoria were very busy trying to find a helpmate for me some of them even went so far as to send ladies whom they wanted me to marry on trips up the coast but while i of course appreciated their kindness i would much have preferred to make my own choice if i had felt so inclined after a short silence i even had a love letter once would you believe it a lady in victoria wrote me that she had admired me from the first day she had heard of my work and still more so after she met me and that she gladly would have become my wife and joined me in my work had i asked her but that i never asked that she before she on the morrow was to become another honourable man's wife thought she would close these pages of her life by telling me what her feelings had been and she was no old maid neither he added with a humorous twinkle in his eye she was a fine-looking young girl and a very good woman i guess she wanted me to know what i had missed would you mind telling me the real reason you never married i asked was it not because your experience with mrs tugwell the first lady missionary sent out to you prejudiced you against all women oh no he said i had better sense than that i knew very well there were a few of them who could make biscuits but i made up my mind that i could not conscientiously ask any refined woman to come up and share my lonely life among the indians hundreds of miles from all the comforts of life i knew well enough that i could ask no one else to make the sacrifice i made i knew that nothing would have been so precious to me as human sympathy and interest in my work no greater help to me than to have some one share my sorrows and troubles as well as my joys and my glorious experiences but i also knew that what was promised in enthusiasm might be rude after years of hard trial and that the time might come when i might be compelled to give up my life work at the solicitation of a wife who had become tired of the tribulations of a career among the indians in brief i made up my mind that my life work was of greater importance to me than domestic happiness and so i pursued my solitude and still i am wrong in calling it solitude god was with me do you know when i returned to england in eighteen eighty five and met an agnostic who expressed doubt about god's existence i said to him sir do not talk that way to me i have been in god's presence during my solitude among the savages there have been times when i felt god's very presence when it seemed to me that i even saw his face and as mr duncan's eyes glowed when he said it and as his face shone in the moonlight i really believed that he had 
i thought i could see in it the reflection of yahweh's glory like every old bachelor of course mr duncan has his peculiarities thus he allows no person to come into his bedroom for these many years he has persisted in making his own bed and himself takes care of his immediate belongings even his office must be free from female interference it is only on rare occasions when he has been away perhaps once every four or five years that mrs wallace has had the privilege of dusting and cleaning it and putting things in order but after such a house cleaning it takes him quite a while until he gets everything back into that beautiful disorder the mixture on the floor and chairs and shelves and tables of books and boxes and papers and letters which enables him to find anything he wants when he wants it because he remembers just where he put it and how many other layers have been placed above it for he has a memory which seems almost superhuman he not only practically knows the whole bible by heart but he can reel off whole sentences from books that he has read perhaps years ago and recite hymns and songs at pleasure names of the most insignificant person whom he has met once in his life forty fifty or even sixty years ago seem to come as readily to his tongue as if they were impressed on his mind but yesterday one day some three years ago i stood near him on the dock at metlakatla as the spokane with a large number of excursionists was about getting away a kind-hearted elderly lady who had shown great interest in the work asked him what have you done about a successor what is to become of this glorious work when you die he did not answer in words the index finger of his right hand was lifted on high pointing up into the sky above it was not done for effect i saw a glorious ray of faith in his eye i then believed that god would provide i still so believe and yet i betray no professional secret for mr duncan has himself spoken of it to the indians when i say that he has to my knowledge in his will provided that all he owns in the world is after his death to go into the hands of three intimate friends to be by them held in trust for the benefit of the indians for the purpose of maintaining among them the same christian work in the same spirit as it has by him been carried on we all hope and trust however that god will give him many years of life and of work to his glory yet but when the time comes when his life work shall be ended and god the almighty father shall want him to come home i hope it will be to his good fortune to look for the last time into the indescribably rich beauty of a glorious alaska sunset and that the lord of hosts as he took elijah of old will send down his chariot of fire in which to take to the paradise of the christ above the sunlit clouds his venerable lovable servant william duncan the apostle of alaska end of chapter forty two end of the apostle of alaska the story of william duncan of metlakatla by john w arctander